Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, thanks for uh, joining us. It's great to see uh, so many people out here tonight. Um, Brenda is going to talk about the um, multiple threats to Canadians, can Canadian public universities. Uh, funding decreases and challenges to collegial governance are pushing public universities to the brink of disaster. Uh, they certainly are. And the poor working conditions that this is creating means poor learning conditions for students. And the increase in collective actions that oppose these threats uh, are not just worthy of note, of note, but they're things that we should celebrate and support. Absolutely. For those of you who don't know her, Brenda is the head of the Department of English, Theater, Film and Media at the U of M. She has been a, a longtime activist in, in university politics. She started out in an organizing drive in what is now QP 3909, the union representing student academic workers at the U of M. And she was its first president when it was union, the union was certified in the mid 80s. Brenda was also president of the Manitoba Faculty Association for two terms and a member of the UMFA bargaining team for four rounds of negotiations. She's currently the president of the Canadian Association of University Teachers. So for tonight, Brenda will uh, talk to us about the universities on the brink of disaster for about 30 minutes or so, something like that. Uh, and then we're going to invite all of you uh, into a conversation with Brenda about a better post-secondary future. So I'll now turn this over to Brenda. There you go. Thank you, Wayne. Hello, everybody. Thanks very much for turning on your screens and uh, I mean, you know, coming back to this flat world in which <clears throat> whenever somebody teaches or gives a presentation, we all do our, our conjuring of... Uh, a TV program from my youth, uh, the Romper Room Lady, right? Where you sort of hold up and say, oh, I see this person, I see this person. So it's great to see um, everybody's squares uh, laid out here um, the way we often are. Um, so when I talked to Wayne and Karen about this, I was prepared to, you know, to give a PowerPoint presentation if I had to, but I didn't really want to. I do have some slides to show simply to provide people with maybe some, some sense of um, uh, kind of shape or direction for what otherwise is really intended to be quite a casual conversation about disaster, <laughs> if there can be such a thing. Um, and when we talked about the title or the kind of capacity praise for this uh, talk, um, I did think about uh, universities on the brink because I think about universities as teetering on the brink of um, a, a terrible transformation, a transformation that has in some cases already and in some ways already taken place um, and is underway in uh, a differential uh, fashion, depending on what country you're in um, and what kind of institution that you're in. In the same way that I guess we think about um, international development as a uh, uh, touching people, affecting populations and people in different ways. We think about capital and the way that it differentially affects um, people. I think we can think about um, really the devolution or dismantling of the university and the college system. I don't want to forget about colleges because they are actually far more, far closer to governments than universities are, are supposed to be. Um, but the transformation that is taking place in the post-secondary education system, uh, PSE for short, is uh, for those of us who believe in a public system in which teaching, research, and service is undertaken for the public good uh, is quite horrifying. So I guess I'll, um, I will bring up a couple of slides just to keep me grounded and maybe to help um, guide people for whom this may um, not be so familiar. Um, but I want big picture to talk uh, first of all about funding and then to talk about governance and then to talk about really the results of um, the kind of uh, attacks and uh, forces coming from, from inside and outside the university and taking the form 
of uh, funding, weaponizing of funding, and um, really the transformation of governance. So I will do a little bit of the old screen share, um, simply because I think sometimes it can be uh, helpful. So I think that you can now see it, but I'll actually bring it up um, as a uh, slide shoe, I hope. Slide show, come on, slide. Uh, so anyway, we'll, we'll keep it here. Um, so universities on the brink, talk about funding. So there's a funding crisis in the post-secondary education <laughs> sector that uh, most of us will have come in contact uh, with at some point uh, or another. Um, federal funding cuts have been ongoing for several decades, but I think that uh, for those of us who might ally ourselves with the left, it can come as a shock to realize that the last core infusion of money into our sector took place under the Stephen Harper regime in 2008. Um, and uh, we haven't had a core increase since then. There has been an escalator in terms of funding, like every year there's a little bit added to uh, what we call the CST, the Canadian Social Transfer. That's the money that comes from the federal government and flows out to the provinces for things like health and education. So there's a little bit of an escalator every year for that uh, CST. But there hasn't been a, a real improvement to the, to the core funding that goes to the provinces. So a lot of the problems that we're facing sit with the federal government, which has um, often not just begged poor, but has uh, often sort of um, fended off the demand for a national post-secondary education strategy by saying that after all, post-secondary education is a provincial responsibility. And it's always possible uh, to say, as CAUT has said, as our partner um, affiliates at the provincial level have said, you know, the federal government and the provinces can work together. We've seen them work together on a housing initiative. And, you know, just this week, we're seeing the successful, and in the case of the Ford government, not so successful um, partnership emerging when it comes to uh, childcare provisions. So it just isn't true that you can't make it work in a federal system like Canada. You could. So federal funding and the kind of ghosting, what I call the federal ghosting of the post-secondary education sector, you turn around, you're dancing with your partner, and then they've left you. Um, this is uh, part of the difficulty we're dealing with. And it might also come as a surprise that when you actually look at the figures, these are stats can, I just pulled some stats can stuff here, we're 27 out of 33 um, OECD countries organization, you know, economic and development countries, when it comes to the split between private and public funding for post-secondary education. So the federal government and all other forms of public funding now contribute less than 50% of what it costs to run a university or a college generally across the country. We've slipped below the level of random. So that's why a very troubling phrase has started to emerge in some of the discourse from uh, leaders, uh, administrators, uh, provincial and federal officials that universities and colleges are publicly assisted, no longer publicly funded, but publicly assisted. So what should be a badge of shame that the government's not funding it properly has now begun to shift into just like, well, you're no longer public, you're just kind of publicly helped. So it's as if we've already become a bit of a private public partnership, which is alarming. This kind of federal um, funding crisis is in many cases exacerbated at the provincial level, right? So as the money from the Canadian social transfer gets delivered, of course it, it leaks. It leaks into highways, it leaks into buildings, it leaks into pet projects, it leaks into 
gazebos in Northern Ontario. And so it never, it, not all of it actually reaches the target. The last time I checked the figures, I think it was 30% of that Canadian social transfer was supposed to go, is supposed to go to education, post-secondary education. And um, not all of it makes it. And then when it does, uh, the money is once again, often redirected or withheld by provincial governments, um, most often conservative ones, who uh, quite actively now weaponize that, that funding. And by weaponizing, I mean, they really use it as a club against, um, against universities in particular, colleges too, but universities in particular. Um, the Kenny government in the last year and a half has cut more than $117 million from the post-secondary education sector. And those cuts were differential. Uh, so uh, say, I think it was Alberta, University of Alberta, I think it's cut with something like 20% of its grant was cut. Uh, Calgary, a little less. And then some of the other colleges in the system got say a 7% cut or an 8% cut, but the big slamming devastating cuts were reserved for the big up till then publicly funded universities that serve most of the, uh, the communities and students living in cities like um, Edmonton and that have at least up till now, basic arts and basic science research and teaching in their remit. We had a similar situation, uh, the Pallister mandate, which uh, apparently is being uh, carried on um, by uh, Heather Stephenson. Uh, the mandate, you know, we're included under the PSSA, the Public Services Sustainability Act, the act that was never proclaimed, but hangs like the proverbial sword of Damocles over the heads of uh, public sector workers. Um, and had it, uh, last year, uh, the University of Manitoba administration offered a one-time COVID payment. It was, didn't even go to base salaries. It was just a payment in recognition of COVID hardship. So that a one-time COVID uh, payment of $1,200, no, up $1,900, I think in the end, to uh, staff members. And the value of all those payments was cut from the grant. So the Pallister government exact, like really does um, eye for an eye, not even an eye for an eye, really uh, an eye uh, taken away or a hand taken away. It amputates, it cuts, even when an administration tries to act fairly. So that's the kind of vicious weaponizing of funding at the provincial level that universities and colleges are facing. The response to the lack of funding has made administrations understandably quite desperate for revenue streams. And they've, uh, they've turned to some pretty sketchy um, ways to improve those revenue uh, balance sheets. One is international student privateering. And that is uh, trying to recruit students and charge them at least twice, in some cases, three times the amount of tuition that would be charged to a student resident uh, in the province or in the country. And um, uh, the, there have been a couple of exposés recently in national publications about the industry, the business of recruiting international students for post-secondary education. And um, some of the terrible, again, pretty scuzzy dealings that go on there. And of course, once international students come to Canada and come to provinces and come to towns and cities in which colleges and universities are again, quite desperate for that extra money, um, issues of housing, transportation, um, adequate food um, and food kinds of food um, all sorts of, of uh, service provisions for, for students uh, far from home with no community um, become another whole issue. 
The other thing that's exacerbated by the lack of um, good funding really is a reliance on private donors. And, uh, um, oh, I wanted to mention Laurentian in there because that's one of the things that Laurentian faced. Laurentian was one of the universities that was more and more and more dependent on international student dollars and the reliance on international student fees in combination with sheer incompetence, just um, financial incompetence and um, wrongdoing really. Uh, was one of the causes of the Laurentian debacle and the filing for insolvency under the um, Company Creditors um, Arrangement Act, CCAA, that particularly loathsome piece of federal legislation devised by, um, oh, heavens, what's his name? <laughs> um, Kretschian's finance officer. Anyway, I'll get it, you know, the guy. Uh, reliance on private donors often comes hand in hand with desperation for funding. And it's not a surprise that private donors want to deliver money to have a building or a program uh, named after them. Um, it's not necessarily a surprise that people want to use their money in order to gain some you know, sense of immortality or control or influence over academia. Yeah, Paul Mart, sorry, gee, how could I forget? Um, but what is a shame is that more and more our administrations are giving in to those requests and the University of Toronto um, giving in essentially to, uh, again, some pretty shady dealings um, uh, by a, a private donor who sought to interfere in the academic hiring of Valentina Azarova for a position at the University of Toronto Law School and uh, kind of scotched the hiring, resulted in a motion of censure. Sorry, that's my computer. Um, a motion of uh, censure against the University of Toronto. We can talk a little bit more about that in the Q&A if we want to, also about Laurentian. So these things are kind of related uh, to that absence of core funding, although some of them um, could happen in any case. We also have a governance crisis. So we got a funding crisis, both outside and inside the university. And we have a governance crisis taking place both inside and outside the university or having its roots both inside and outside the university. So one of the um, sources of the governance crisis we're facing these days is very assertive, quite aggressive provincial appointments to boards of governors. Boards of governors ideally uh, perhaps would be set up the way municipal uh, boards or councils are with people, you know, with, a, with a, a community stake in the institution, not just people from business or people from, you know, banks, people from government, um, that kind of thing. But more and more what CAUT has found doing some research and some study on boards of governors, which is actually on the CAUT website. If you're interested, caut.ca, look up governance and you'll find all sorts of info. Boards of governors are becoming more and more and more business oriented, industry oriented, and less community oriented. Fewer um, boards of governors appointed because of their community activism or community roots. Um, our senates, Senates at the university is supposed to be the highest academic body of, uh, of the institution. So boards of governors are supposed to look after you know, the nuts and bolts of money and the Senate is supposed to look after academic concerns. And that's that bicameral governance structure people often hear about um, when we talk about university uh, governance. But um, faculty, who do not hold appointments at the above the level of head, at least in, in our um, province, tend to get shut out of uh, either Board of Governors appointments or, um, well, they're in, they're in Senate, but Senates, uh, Senates are more and more 
um, governed and dominated by administrators. So people who are out of scope, who don't have a place in the faculty association are now the people who often hold more of the votes on, a, on, a, on Senate. So Senate meets in a big chamber, it discusses the values and the policies and ideally the academic direction of the institution. But um, more often than not, uh, faculty, rank and file faculty, no longer have a majority vote on Senates. So um, some people um, that I know who are faculty activists uh, tend to withdraw from Senate um, positions kind of in despair, but I do think still that Senates are a valuable um, place for faculty voices to be heard. So what we find over the course of the last 20, 30 years is that a top-down decision-making structure that sort of comes from the corporate world has eaten away at a traditional slow paced, yes, and often annoying, but um, more authentic collegial decision making process, which as I say is often slow. Um, it does take time for committees to discuss things and then to come up with a recommendation and then bring that recommendation to Senate where ideally the entire faculty or the you know, representatives from the faculty body get to discuss things important uh, to the direction of the university or the college. Colleges have these, um, these, board, these, these bodies too. Often they're not called senates, they're called governing councils, but colleges have them also. And in the case of both colleges and universities, they're both being eroded by the incursion of um, what people have begun to theorize as managerialism, right? A philosophy of top-down uh, replacing collegial collective decision-making with um, uh, corporate style decision-making. So what do you get when you put a financial crisis and a lot of cuts together with a kind of corporate decision-making model. What, what does it add up to? What's the, what, what, do the, what do these things do? Well, I think they work together in a kind of, I don't wanna say it's even a vicious circle because it's not necessarily cyclical. They pile up on each other. And what they do is they increase, for example, the number of academics holding precarious positions. If you begin to think of the university or the college as a business, as an industry, as an enterprise, and not as a public service, then that encourages money-saving, profit-taking, rent-seeking behavior. And that inevitably results in cuts to a quality uh, academic workforce. And we see that all over um, Canada. CAUT estimates, and it is an estimate because I'll tell you why it's an estimate later, um, estimates that about a third of the people who now teach in the academic workforce are precarious. And by precarious, I mean have short-term contracts, uh, anywhere from six weeks long or three months long, if they're lucky, maybe eight to 10 weeks long. If they're incredibly lucky, maybe 12 months long. But we've actually seen in BC the emergence of six week short term contracts. So these contracts are, um, they can be renewed at the discretion of, say, the dean or whatever line manager is responsible for that unit. Um, these contracts are underpaid. They don't come with um, any, usually any benefits at all, uh, any vacation, any entitlements. And with the increase in that precarious workforce, there is a consequent undermining of academic freedom. People on short-term precarious contracts are not going to question ahead well, they might question ahead if the head is in 
the cohort union with them, but they certainly aren't going to challenge a dean. And they're certainly not going to go to Senate and challenge a president or a vice president. They're not going to end up in Senate because they're so busy marking their 250 papers for you know, the course that they're being paid um, $4,000 um, you know, a month, not a month, for a term for. They're not going to have time to go to Senate. And, they, and the research capacity that precarious academics could bring to the world is lost also because um, the short-term contracts don't make any allowance for service usually, or uh, in most cases, uh, research. And the precarity, the precarious workers among us aren't entitled to any kind of research support at the university and college. They usually shut out of any grant application. The other horror that's arising hand in hand with an increase in the precarious workforce is ed tech. And uh, some people will have heard of ed tech and ed tech really is the instructional, bun the bundling of instructional materials, um, sometimes actually using AI uh, and uh, software uh, to replace the firmware of uh, real live academics and real live teachers. And ed tech, um, ed tech has blossomed in COVID. And I'm sure I'm not alone in receiving all of these ads for you know bundled courses and programs that you can um, install as a you know university administration person um, to you know make instruction more efficient. So to get rid of the friction of um, human learning and make it frictionless. Uh, and we're back to the injection model uh, of learning. And all of this, the increase in precarity, ed tech as a replacement for professional expertise and choice and instruction and the undermining of academic freedom reinforces uh, systemic inequalities in the post-secondary education landscape. Um, the university is a colonial feature of Canada as it is in other settler uh, states and countries like Australia, for example. Um, and uh, it's white, it's Western, uh, it's traditionally and even now hostile to anti-Black uh, engagement with um, you know, racism, the history of racism in Canada. And these inequalities and these systems of racism, sexism, homophobia, uh, 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 an inability to make space for um, persons with disabilities, let alone disability studies, is all exacerbated by uh, precarity. Because most of the people being hired on these precarious short-term contracts are uh, people who um, apply for work in the academy, in the college system, uh, as members of equity deserving groups. So it is, a, 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 this is like a cook's tour of, of disaster. Um, and I've been trying for ages when I talk about this and when we meet as, as code activists to get a grip on a metaphor or an analogy to describe for myself and to others, the value of a university or college, like what is it that it deserves saving, that it deserves preservation, that it deserves to be, um, it has to change, yes, but um, fund it properly, treat it well, make it better, and the image I came up with in the last couple of days was old growth forest. Um, now, unlike an old growth forest, a university is a constructed thing, right? It's a human made endeavor. It's a human made institution. But I think of it as analogous to an old growth forest because it's haphazard. It has various internal logics. It provides a habitat for a lot of different ways of thinking and being. And to certain eyes, 
it has as much value as an old growth forest. If you're somebody who sees the value of trees only as lumber, then an old growth forest is just, it's just money standing around waiting to be harvested. And I'm afraid that what we face and what we have been facing and are facing is an attitude that the university or the college system is just wasted lumber. All of this stuff needs to be clear cut. It needs to be made as efficient as possible. And we need to wrench the use value out of these just old trees and books and texts and libraries and archives. And what the heck do you need all this for? You know, if it isn't boots for industry, then why the heck are we funding it? So that's at my lowest point. Um, and then I think um, have to end on, on something uh, more cheerful. And I think we do see signs of things to be celebrated. And that is um, kind of a wake up call, I think on the part of a lot of academic staff that they are workers after all, they might've thought of themselves as at one point, gentlemen or gentlewoman scholars, but they're not, they're workers. And like other workers, they can be dispensed with and deprived of their workplace rights. And if they want them, not just their own workplace rights, but to see those rights in, in connection with the larger community, the larger forest uh, and meadows uh, to which they belong, they have to start organizing. So old fashioned organizing models um, peer to peer communication of the value of the university and the college, the value of collegial governance, the value of service in the name of the public good, a mobilizing model in which um, uh, academics start to uh, become active in their own associations, should they be uh, fortunate enough to have a certified trade union representing them. And if not, uh, they're their organizations on campus, their caucuses on campus, they can, we can make and have made and should continue to make a common cause with campus unions, with student groups, and more importantly and more crucially, I think, with the public sector and uh, labor uh, and progressive community groups more largely to reroute the university and college in the communities that they serve, that, uh, that they, take their local character from. And uh, I guess I've seen, and if you have, if people here have not just followed what's happening um, in Canada, but also happened, uh, happened a few years ago in the US with the Red for Ed campaign, uh, happened, if you follow um, UCU, which is the parent um, uh, union for, uh, um, academic workers in the UK, uh, if you follow the National Tertiary Education Union in Australia, you will see a much more assertive militancy beginning to uh, not just form, but really articulate itself. Strike after strike after strike, labor action after labor action, um, more and more and more as academic workers realize staying quiet, just staying at home, doing your research, you know, preparing your next lesson is not going to save you. It just isn't. Um, finding allies on the front lines uh, with uh, health workers, for example, who have already undergone that kind of gigification of their work, which is happening to our work, um, is, the way, is the way forward. So I have like 30 seconds. No, I have a few more minutes. Um, and uh, I think that action has to be rooted, first of all, in the local community. Um, and as I say, there's a, a very, uh, um, the, 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 the labor, uh, labor activism has a good strong roots in Winnipeg, uh, going back uh, much farther than, than 1919, but that's our, uh, that's our lodestar. And uh, I do want to um, kind of conclude maybe a little early with some heartening pictures of what some of that militancy looks like um, across the country uh, here, right, right here for now, um, with some pictures of the current UMFA strike. Uh, second strike in five years. Uh, what you see on um, 
on one side of your screen is um, Strike Mike. He's uh, the picket captain of my picket line at the university at the at the ledge, um, strumming on uh, his old um, uh, uke, and uh, he leads us every day in uh, "There Is Power in the Union" um, by Billy Bragg, whose lyrics we've changed to make them uh, more inclusive of people of all genders. And on the, on the right, it's my right uh, uh, of the screen, you'll see the pickets at the Chancellor Matheson entrance to the University of Manitoba. Um, I wanna show you a couple of other things. University of Toronto action, really amazing action in, in support of the censure motion passed by CAUT council last April. And there was again, a grassroots community uh, organized, um, group called U of T censured, a lot of academics, but not exclusively academics. And they just took the censure and ran with it. And they organized all sorts of teach-ins and talk-ins and, and uh, social media actions and really did an astonishing job of carrying that, uh, that censure uh, forward. And on the other side of that screen, you see students uh, protesting the the uh, filing of um, the Laurentian University Administrators for Protection under the CCAA, which resulted in the closure of the, of the fully funded, fully subscribed midwifery program. So even by the logic of bean counters and uh, university and college administrators, that, that program the Northern uh, Midwifery Program, which served a Francophone and Indigenous communities in Canada's North, should have been, uh, you know, a slam dunk for, for salvation. Why cut that? So um, I wanted to show you some, some pictures of uh, the kind of activism that I think uh, our moment calls for. There's always been, I think, latent um, capacity for activism in the university and college sector, perhaps more in the college than in some um, branches of the universities. Uh, again, people who may not feel themselves um, called or hailed, uh, interpolated by the word worker, um, but um, those days are fast leaving us. And I think our future, if the university and college sector is going to have a future that preserves um, the humane university, uh, it's gonna come with this kind of activism.